Hello and welcome to Crime Divers. I'm Laura. And I'm Jill. Join us this week as we dive into the crimes of Dennis Nelson. Hello. Hi there and welcome back. Um, so we'll just get right into it. Today we're, get, we're covering the crimes of Dennis Nelson who, mm. if you haven't heard of him, is a serial killer. I haven't heard of him. She's never heard of anybody. I have heard of some, <laughs> but I haven't heard of this guy. So I am very, very interested to see, well, to hear, I should say, what he did. Right. Okay, let's go. Okay, let's go for it. Right. Um, I'm just. I'll just dive into his childhood to start off with. Give a bit of background. Okay. Dennis Andrew Nelson was born on the 23rd of November 1945 in Fraserburgh, Aberdeenshire, which is in Scotland. Nice. He is Scottish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. Um, he was the middle child, born to Elizabeth. Duffy White and Olav Magnus Mokshim. What? What yeah. kind of names are they? Who had adopted the name Nelson. You well, he's not, the dad was Nor- Norwegian. Ah, right, okay. I was, was going to say you sure you didn't just make those names up. No. <laughs> His dad was a Norwegian soldier, if you'd let me get to it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> who had travelled to Scotland in 1940 as part of the Free Nor- Norwegian Forces following the German occupation of Norway. He married Elizabeth White in May 1942 and they moved into her parents' house. Uh, The marriage was difficult. Olaf did not view marriage with any seriousness, being preoccupied with his duties with the Free Norwegian forces and he didn't spend much time with Elizabeth or put any effort into finding a home for them. Um, The couple divorced in 1948, realising they had rushed into marriage without thinking. Dennis was really close to his maternal grandfather and would say that life was empty while he was away at sea as he was a fisherman. On the 31st of October 1951, whilst fishing in the North Sea, his grandfather died of a heart attack. In the years following his grandfather's death, he became quiet and withdrawn. He grew to resent the attention that his brother and sister got from his mother and his grandmother and he was jealous of his brother's popularity. Hmm. So he wasn't very popular then? Obviously not. Um, eventually, sorry, eventually Nelson and his, mo- his mum and his older brother Olaf and his younger sister Sylvia moved out of his grandparents' house and into a flat. She later married a builder called Andrew Scott and they had four kids together and they all moved to Stricken in 1955. Okay. When Nelson started puberty, he realised that he was gay. Um, which at first he felt confused and ashamed. He kept that, his was that that wasn't really a thing back. Well, I know it was a thing, but I mean it wasn't talked about, was it back then? It was no, nineteen fifty-five. Yeah, it wasn't. Was it legal? I don't know. I don't know. know. Cause I don't know if it, it really used to, it was used to, it used to be illegal, didn't it? I I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but but obviously it wasn't. So a, it wasn't something that he would really be going to shout about anytime no. soon. Pretty much. He kept his sexuality a secret from his family and friends. Some of the boys that he was attracted to had similar fe- facial features as his sister, Sylvia. So he sexually fondled her, thinking that his attraction towards boys might be a man- manif- sorry, manifestation of the care that he felt for her. Which... That just sounds wrong. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, he's confused. He doesn't really know. I know, but, I mean, even if you're confused, I mean, you don't look at your sister that way, surely. <laughs> no, but he's trying to sort of figure out his feelings and why he's feeling that way towards boys. Mm. So, as I said, like, he's trying to think, he's thinking it, it could be just the way that he cared cared about her. It was just the manifestation of it. Oh, right. Sorry. Like, yeah, he shouldn't have sexually fondled her, obviously. Yeah. But he was, you know, he was obviously trying to figure out his feelings and why why he felt like that surely there's better ways <laughs> to figure that out but <laughs> well he, obviously he was young he wouldn't have had anybody to talk to about it no i guess so not. he also fondled his big brother while he was sleeping oh god um and olaf his big brother started to suspect that nelson was gay and would refer to him as hen in public which for anybody who isn't Scot- scottish hen is a S- scottish slang for a female yeah yeah, it's not a chicken. No. 
Well, it is a chicken. But <laughs> it's actually... I don't like it. I no, hate... I don't like it. And it's kind of a lot of older people use it. Yeah, see when anybody goes, they go, thanks, hen. And I'm yeah. like, oh, it's just like cringe. I just, yeah, I, I don't really, really don't... like it when somebody calls me hen. It's just... No. It's weird. I know. I just, I don't like it. It's not, I mean, I just... You know, not for me. I certainly don't call anybody that. And uh, no, I, I never call anybody hen. That's no. as I said. Like to, I just feel it's like old people that yeah. refer to younger people as hen. Like yeah, it's weird. I would never call no, anybody hen. Not for me, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so Nelson did well at school. He left in 1961 and decided to join the army to train as a chef. He enlisted for nine years service and started his training with the Army Catering Corps at St. Omar Barracks in Aldershot. He kept his sexuality hidden and wouldn't shower with his colleagues because he was scared he would get an erection, so he bathed alone and he could masturbate in private. Too much information, but okay, yes. you know, I'll have to get it all in there. That is a bit much information, <laughs> but fair um, In 1964, he passed his initial catering ex- exam and was assigned to the 1st Battalion of the Royal Fusiliers, in Germany, where he served as a private, he so, would drink a lot to ease his shyness. Sorry, were you going to say something there? Yeah, I was going to say. So he sounds like he'd, he'd maybe sorted himself out a bit there and was going down a, a good path. Sounds like it. Yeah. So far, so good. Really. <laughs> yeah. Apart from the sexually fondling his siblings, yeah. mm-hmm. so far so good. Mm-hmm. Um. So sorry, where was I? He, he would drink a lot to ease his shyness, and he would pretend to fall un- un- unconscious in the hope that one of his colleagues would make sexual use of his body. Um, he was also fantasising about him having a sexual partner who would be unconscious or dead. Okay. Yeah. So, he, you know, mm. yeah. <laughs> he had some Starting fantasies. to go a bit downhill mm. now. <laughs> um, in 1967, he was deployed to the state of Aden, where he served as a cook at the Al Mansura prison. It was quite dangerous there, and Nelson's regiment lost several men due to ambushes on the way back to the army barracks. Oh. Nelson was what once kidnapped by an Arab taxi driver who beat him unconscious and put him in the boot of his car. When he was dragged back out of the boot, uh, Nelson grabbed a jack handle and knocked the, tr- the taxi driver to the ground before beating him unconscious. <laughs> so then he locked the man in the boot of his taxi. Oh, well, serves him right, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, take that. T- t- taste your own medicine there. Um, while he was stationed at Aden, he was still fantasising about being with a man who was either unconscious or dead, and he would masturbate while looking at his own naked body in the mirror. <laughs> Stop looking just, at me like that. I know, but... <sighs> it's all part of the story. Yeah, I know, but I'm just, like, wondering how worse it's going to get. I mean, it's a Well, bit... it's going to get a lot worse than that. This is just <laughs> fantasy at this point. He would position it so that his head was out of view, so that he could visualise himself engaged in a sexual act with another man. That's just really random. Well, you know, whatever works. <laughs> right, moving on. Um, when he completed his deployment in Aden, he returned to Britain, then Cyprus, then Berlin, which is where he had his first sexual experience with a female who was a prostitute, but he said that intercourse with a woman was overrated and depressing. Thanks very much for that. I know, I was just going to say cheers. <laughs> it's a bit insulting to all women. It is, isn't it? Um, he ended his 11-year military career at the rank of corporal in October 1972, Um, And he lived with his family until December while he decided what to do next. One day he watched a a documentary about male homosexuality with his brother, sister-in-law and another couple. Um, Dennis, he spoke out in defence of gay rights and the others obviously didn't agree and a fight started. Mm, I suppose again back then, you know, it wasn't accepted or or, or anything back then, was it? It was totally different times yep Olaf went on to tell their mother that Nelson was gay and Nelson never spoke to his brother again oh well and only had uh, and he only had written contact with his mum stepfather and siblings occasionally after that he decided to join the Metropolitan Police and moved to London in December to begin the training course so he was a police officer (laughs) (laughs) my god (laughs) Um, well not for long I don't think um in April 1973, Nelson completed his training and it was po- he was posted to Willesden Green. He enjoyed the work, but it was missing the army. He began to drink alone in the evenings. 
Um, later he started going to gay pubs and had a lots of casual sexual encounters with men. He viewed these encounters as soul destroying and a vain search for inner peace as he looked for a long term relationship. That must be his words. Right. Because I would never say anything like that. No. <laughs> um, at one point after a failed relationship he came to the conclusion that his personal lifestyle was at odds with his professional life. Um, around the same time his birth father died leaving his three children a thousand pound each. Um, and a, f- a few months later, he resigned from the police. I'm, I'm assuming a thousand pounds must be yeah, getting oh, money back. I was going to say back then it would have been quite a so lot of money. Must have gave him the luxury to kind of leave his job and then look for something else. Yeah, sounds like it. So, <clears throat> so yeah, he mustn't have been in the police for very long. Um, he worked as, um, in security for a few months, and then he became a civil servant. He worked in a job centre as an e- executive officer, and he still had that job until he was arrested. So to be fair, he sounds you know. If you if you just listen to that and you know not knowing what else he might have done, I mean, he sounds like an all right. He all sounds right like a, he sounds like a normal. Apart from the again, yeah. the the thing with his brother and sister, but he sounds like a normal gay man who was obviously he was didn't maybe confused and yeah, he was just struggling to come to terms. Yeah, with, strugg- exactly yeah. That's what and because it wasn't to so to ter- terms with his sexuality, yeah. but like career wise, like he didn't you know he just seemed like a normal guy. Yeah, but. Sometimes it's the normal ones that are That's, the worst. Yeah, that will change. Um, so in 90, um, sorry, November 1975, Nelson came across a 20-year-old man named David Gall- Gallican, and it, um, he was being threatened outside a pub by two men. Nelson intervened and took David back to his room that he rented in a the house. They drank and talked. David had just... <laughs> sorry, I just burped here. <laughs> I was, I was trying to keep it quiet, but then I looked at Laura and she started laughing. So I, I if yeah, you heard it, I apologise. I'm not editing. So no, I was going to say apologize. we're so we're so unprofessional. Um, okay, they drank and talked. David had just moved to London. I was unemployed and living in a hostel. They decided to move into a larger place together, and a few days later, they viewed a vacant ground floor flat at 195 Melrose Avenue. So they were only together for a few days. Oh, and they were moving in together. Yeah. Mm. Um, well, you know, Nelson nego- negotiated a deal with the landlord that they got exec. Can't talk. They got exclusive use of the back garden, and they moved in. What? So nobody else in that flat was allowed to use the garden. No. It's a bit harsh, isn't it? Mm. But he ne- negotiated a deal with the landlord, so maybe they paid extra rent or something to to get use of the back garden. Mm. You'll find out why later. I was going to say, <laughs> I don't know if I would uh, be happy with that though, as a as a um, tenant. Well, if you're already living there, yeah. then somebody else comes along and says, "Oh, by the way, um, you know, you're not allowed to use the garden anymore." Yeah, I'd be like, "Well, I'm not paying as much rent then." <laughs> mm. Who knows? Um, so Nelson was sexually attracted to David, but they hardly ever had sex. After a year, the relationship started be- to become a strain. They slept in separate beds and they both began to bring home casual sex partners. In May 1977, Nelson threw David out. He had a few flings over the next 18 months, but nothing ever lasted more than a few weeks. And by late 1978, he was living a solitary existence, just going to work and drinking and listening to music at night. Hmm. Okay, <laughs> are you ready? This is where oh, it, is this where it gets really dark. This and is where it gets dark. Okay. So, Stephen Holmes met Dennis Nelson on the thirtieth of December, nineteen seventy eight, in the Cricklewood Arms pub. Stephen had tried to buy alcohol, but as he was only fourteen, he was refused. What the heck is he doing in a pub at fourteen? <laughs> I have no idea. Um, Nelson invited Stephen to his house, promising him more alcohol, but well, well, alcohol and music. He apparently apparently thought he was about seventeen. Right. Um, they drank a lot and fell asleep. The next morning, Stephen was still asleep when Nelson woke up. He didn't want to wake him in case he left. He started running his hands over Stephen and over Stephen and decided he was going to make him stay over the new year, whether he liked it or not. Oh, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> nope. So, he grabbed a tie and he strangled Stephen into unconsciousness before drowning him in a bucket of water. <sighs> That's... Yeah. This is nice. Nelson masturbated twice over Stephen, then put his body under the floorboards. That's just horrible. The bound corpse was left there for nearly eight months. Oh my God, the smell. 
before Nelson bought, built a bonfire in the garden uh, <laughs> behind his flat and burned it on the 11th of August 1979. Right. So that's first murder done. That's just... I can't forget, I, mean, I forget that you actually don't know this story, so... No, I know, I have no idea what's coming, so I'm like, well, what's going to happen? So, um, on the 11th of October 1979, Nelson attempted to murder a student from Hong Kong called Andrew Ho. They had met in a pub and went back to Nelson's house for sex. No, Nelson tried to strangle Andrew, um, but he managed to escape and he reported it to the police. Nelson was questioned... But Andrew decided not to press charges, unfortunately. Why would you not? Who knows? I if only he had. I know. That might be a different... Things might have been different, yeah. Yeah, for the, you know... So, on the 3rd of December, 1979, N- Nelson met a 23-year-old Canadian student called Kenneth Ockenden, Ocken- um, who was visiting... <laughs> You're getting challenged with these names today, aren't you? <laughs> I do apologise if I'm pronouncing anything wrong. Um, so, that, um, yeah, he, w- he was visiting relatives in England and they met in a pub and Nelson offered to give Kenneth a tour of London. Nelson then invited Kenneth back to his house for a meal and drinks. Once there Nelson strangled Kenneth with the cord of the headphones as he listened to music. Then he poured himself a glass of rum and continued to listen to music on the headphones that he had just used to murder Kenneth with. My god. How sick. Very. Although I always think that like you know killers like that they they just like they slightly like go into another world or something, like where they just zone out and yeah. you know that, that he probably didn't think anything of. Oh, I've just killed him with that, but I'm just gonna. I want to listen to some music. Like you'd have to be very cold, <sighs> wouldn't you? To right. funnily enough, I actually watched last night. I was looking at on YouTube mm-hmm. and I typed in Dennis Nelson, and there was this very short. I mean, it was literally like a few minutes long, but it was actually an interview with Dennis Nelson. Oh, really? Um, and all I could think was, I mean, as I said, it was only a couple of minutes, but all I could think was he, he just looked dead behind the eyes. Right. And he just spoke so matter-of-factly mm-hmm. about the fact, because he was talking, I think he was he was talking about chopping bodies up. Oh, sorry. I haven't got to that bit yet. <laughs> Ruin the story. Oh, my God. <laughs> sorry. Spoiler alert. Yeah, thanks um, for that. But, yeah, the way that he was talking about it, it was just as if he would just drunk. What was if he'd been chopping up his uh, chicken for his tea or something? Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what it was like. So yeah, you'd, you'd have to be very cold yeah. to do that. So uh, so after he'd murdered Kenneth, the next day Nelson uh, bought a Polaroid camera and took photos of Kenneth's dead body in various suggestive positions. I hate to think. I, I don't even want to think. Um, he then wrapped the body in plastic bags and put it under the floorboards. On four different occasions, they took the body out and seated it on the armchair next to him as he watched the TV and drank alcohol. But, so he buried him under the floorboards, but then occasionally took him out and sat the... Oh my God. That's... Yeah, um, I can't remember who said it. Somebody had said, I don't know if it was him or one of the survivors, like, mm-hmm. um, that I'll get to later. But somebody had said that... He would he would do that like maybe for company he would sit them on the chair and like talk to them and see that's just, and it's very warped yeah very very warped um on the seventeenth of May nineteen eighty Nelson killed his next victim sixteen year old Martin Duffy Mar- Martin was a catering student from Birkenhead who had hitchhiked to London without his parents knowing on the thirteenth of May. After being questioned by the British Transport Police for not paying his train fare. For four days, Martin had slept off near Euston Station um, before Nelson came across him when he was coming home from a conference in Southport. Martin was exhausted and starving and accepted Nelson's offer of a meal and a bed for the night. After Martin had fallen asleep in Nelson's bed, Nelson strangled him, then dragged him into the kitchen and drowned him in the sink. He then had a bath with the dead body. What, he actually had... A bath. Yeah. Really? So it's almost like he wanted a relationship, but just not with a living... Not with a living person, yeah. yeah. It's like, I mean, go and get a teddy or something. I don't know. <laughs> 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 oh, go and get a teddy. Oh, well, that would be better. <laughs> I don't know, but I mean, if you want company and... and you, well, I mean, you, see if we ever bring any, any merch out, we're gonna they're gonna get a t-shirt with "Go and get a teddy." Go and get on a teddy. It. If you feel lonely, go and, <laughs> just go and get a teddy. I know, but if you're saying that 
you know, he obviously won't preferred the company with like not a living thing, then I don't know. <laughs> stick a teddy on the blooming chair and that's just as well, it's not the same. I don't think a teddy has genitals. Because <laughs> he obviously oh, no. like that as well. Well, alright, but it's, I don't know. Can we move on? Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think we should because that, yeah. Um. So, yeah, it, so yeah, he'd had a, a bath with a dead body. Um, Martin's body was then put on a kitchen chair, then on the bed. Uh, Nelson kissed the body and stroked it before and after masturbating while sitting on the stomach of the corpse. Oh, this is just disgusting. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> For two days, Martin's body was kept in a cupboard until Nelson saw signs of bloating, so he put him under the floorboards. Oh, oh, that, does that make a bear? I don't. No, I don't know. I don't understand this. I'm just writing down what I've read. Um, following Martin's murder, Nelson started to kill more often. So, before the end of 1980, he killed five more victims and attempted to murder another. Only one of these murder victims has ever been identified. He was 26-year-old William David Sutherland. Um, Nelson's recollections of the unidentified victims were vague, but he remembered how each victim had been murdered and how long he kept each body before dissection. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't like this guy. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> so, you know, obviously, of course, the bodies under the floorboards were starting to smell and they were attracting insects. Uh-huh. And so sometimes, like, he, he had a look and the bodies were infested with maggots. Oh, Some of the victims' heads had maggots crawling out of eye sockets and mouths. He placed deodorants under the floorboards and sprayed insecticide twice a day, but the smell of decay and the presence of flies remained, obviously. Like, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, putting some deodorant, that's, that's not going to mask the smell. No, that is definitely not. This is a horrible story, isn't it? It is quite a horrible story, actually. Yeah. Yeah. This, is a, this is a a horrible man. Um, mm-hmm. In late 1980, Nelson removed each body that he had killed since December 1979 from under the floorboards, dissected them. What, so they were, I thought, oh, so they weren't there one at a time, like these ones were all there together? Mm-hmm. I think I read that at one point, the, the most that he had under the floor at one time was like six. Oh my God. Six bodies. Um, so he dissected them, then he burned them on a bonfire on waste ground behind his flat. When the bonfire had burnt out, he used a rake to search for any recognisable bones. He found a skull that was still intact. I don't know what's wrong with me today, I cannot <laughs> speak. He found a skull that was still intact, so he smashed it to pieces with his rake. Gosh. What um, happened to the guy? I mean, he started off so well. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. It all went wrong. Oh, you know, went tits up, basically. Uh-huh. Um. So on the 4th of January 1981, um, Nelson met an unidentified man. He said he was an 18-year-old um, blue-eyed Scotsman. They met in a pub and Nelson lured him back to his flat saying they would have a drinking contest. After a few drinks, Nelson strangled his victim with a tie and then put him under the floorboard. Surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise. He called in sick to work on the 12th of January so that he could dissect this victim and another two unidentified victims. One of them said... No, he didn't. One of them, he said, was an English skinhead who had met, met in Leicester, Leicester Square, and the other one was from Belfast and in his early 20s. The final victim, not the final victim overall, but the... Because <laughs> you, you looked hopeful there. <laughs> well, I mean, you just, you're just about to tell us the final victim, so how is it? The final victim to be murdered at Melrose Avenue. Oh, right, okay, you didn't finish your sentence then. No. No, 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 because you looked hopeful. I know, I was thinking, <laughs> yes, the story is almost over. No. <laughs> the final victim to be murdered at Melrose Avenue was 23-year-old Malcolm Barlow, who Nelson found slumped against a wall outside of, outside his home. Of, I'm, so, I'm really sorry, I can't talk today. Yes, you're not doing well. I'm not doing well, right. <sighs> Deep breath. <sighs> Start again. So, the final victim to be murdered at Melrose Avenue was 23-year-old Malcolm Barlow, who Nelson found slumped against a wall outside his home on the 17th of September, 1981. When Nelson asked if Malcolm was okay, he said that his medication had made his legs weak. Nelson phoned for an ambulance and Malcolm was taken to hospital. The next day, when he was released, he went to Nelson's house to say thank you. Bad idea. But I was going to say, how would he know where he, like, 
Because he was outside his house. Oh, outside his house. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I must have not heard you on that. He was slumped against the wall outside his home. All right, sorry. Um, so Nelson made him a meal and they started drinking rum and coke. Malcolm eventually fell asleep on the sofa and Nelson strangled him, then put his body under the kitchen sink the next morning. What, did they fancy a change? Yeah, but I'm just thinking, how big is it under his kitchen sink? Because the cupboard under my sink... Yeah, to be fair, actually. It's not fit. big. You couldn't fit like a, a full size There's no way. adult underneath there. Because no. you've got the pipes. Yeah. So well. like under my sink, like I've got one shelf mm-hmm. which you can only put things on either side because you've got the the, the pipe in the middle yeah. and then you've got like the bottom bit. So like I've got like cleaning stuff and that and that's it. Like there's no way I could fit a body in there. No. Maybe he had a very big cupboard. Wow. Or he just stuffed. I don't know. I, mean, no, I don't really want to talk yeah. about stuffing. I, right? say I don't really want to imagine no. it too much. So in uh, mid 1981, Nelson's landlord decided to renovate 195 Melrose Avenue, so Nelson had to move out. The day before he left the property, he burned the dissected bodies of the last five victims that he had killed on a bonfire. So he then moved into a flat at 23, an attic flat, sorry, at 23D Cranley Gardens in North London on the 5th of October 1981. He had no access to a garden mm-hmm. as he lived in an attic flat. Um, he was unable to put any body, bodies under the floorboards, obviously, because there was like people well, yeah, underneath there's, them. So. There's no floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for nearly two months, anyone who was invited back to Nelson's flat wasn't murdered. So oh, right. Well, they were lucky then. There's always a silver lining. Mm-hmm. Um, although he did attempt to strangle a 19-year-old Paul Nobbs on the 23rd of November 1981 but for some reason he stopped himself from killing him so he was lucky yeah very lucky um, in March 1982 Nelson met 23 year old John Howlett in a pub Nelson invited John back to his flat they watched a film whilst drinking alcohol then John went to the bedroom and fell asleep an hour later Nelson decided to kill him there was a struggle as Nelson tried to strangle John and at one point John tried to strangle Nelson. So we had one that fought back this oh, time. Oh, right, yeah. Um, on three occasions over the following ten minutes, Nelson unsuccessfully attempted to kill his victim before deciding to fill his bath and drown him. So, um, 1982, May 1982, Nelson met Carl Stotter in a pub. He went back to Nelson's flat, when drank some more alcohol. Stotten. <laughs> before falling asleep well maybe he was stotting by the time he had some more alcohol for anybody that doesn't know that's another Scottish slang for being incredibly drunk he and was stotting and you're falling about yes falling about the place not walking well walking at the walls and the yes. doors pretty much me when I'm not drunk <laughs> <laughs> don't need to be drunk to do, to do it here <laughs> he later woke up to Nelson trying to strangle, uh, strangle him and whispering stay still um, later in his testimony at Nelson's trial, Carl said at first he thought Nelson was trying to free him from the zip of the sleeping bag before falling back into unconsciousness. He then vaguely remembered hearing water running before realising he was immersed in the water and that Nelson was trying to drown him. Oh God, imagine waking up to that. I know. But um, when Nelson, Nelson thought that Carl was dead, he sat him in his armchair, um, but then he saw his dog lick, licking Carl's face and he realised that Carl was still alive. So Nelson... Nelson rubbed Carl's limbs and heart to increase circulation, put blankets over him, then laid him on the bed. So, so what, he revived him? Yeah, then, he basically. revived him. Oh, right. um, when Carl regained consciousness, Nelson hugged him and explained that Carl had almost strangled, strangled himself on the zip of the sleeping bag mm-hmm. and that he had resuscitated him. Um, so he stayed, Carl stayed there over the next couple of days and he kept falling in and out of consciousness. Right. When he was stronger... He asked Nelson about his memories of being strangled and immersed in cold water. Nelson explained that he got caught in the zip of the sleeping bag when he had a nightmare and that he had placed him in cold water as he was in shock. Nelson then offered to walk Carl to the tube station, which he said was five minutes away, but they would end up walking for nearly seven miles. And they cut through Highgate Woods, where Carl believed later that Nelson intended on finishing him off there. Oh, right. um, because Carl had stumbled and fell over uh-huh. and Nelson like yanked him back up and pulled his head back but luckily Carl saw a man who was walking his dog right and the man had stopped and he was like staring yeah like obviously like what the hell's going on here must have put him off uh, yeah so um, they ended up just walking to Camden tube station and um, Nelson had said that he wanted to meet Carl the following week and Carl just kind of agreed but like he had no intention of seeing him yeah. again yeah um, but he just wanted to get away from him and 
Um, he wanted to get to the hospital. God, he was lucky, wasn't he? Yeah, so Carl went to the hospital, still believing Nelson's story, that he got caught in a sleeping bag, but the doctor said, I think somebody's tried to kill you. Right. But Carl couldn't believe that. He was like, how can somebody like try to believe you and then just like let you walk out of their flat? Yeah. Um. So he, he didn't believe the doctor and he just wanted to get away. He just wanted to get home. Yeah. Forget so, it. Yeah. He went home and he said he slept for about a week. And the memories just all became faded. Right. Um, but oh, it, it's common for victims of trauma that they can't remember important details, probably because it's um, it's probably too psychologically distressing to, to recall it, I would think. Yeah, um, and he, he didn't feel the need to go to the police. So I take it he must have realised maybe after Nelson got arrested and then he maybe thought, oh, well, actually... Well, no, um, he actually... Well, as... I'm just going on to tell you. Um, Carl Stotter's memories began to resurf- resurface three months later. Right. He started to get flashbacks, which were triggered by him. Read- he was re- he'd been reading a horror story, and he started to get flashbacks. Mm-hmm. Um, he went to his family, and then he went to mental health services for help. But he was persuaded that his flashbacks were false memories caused by the abuse that he had suffered from his ex-boyfriend. So oh, he right. obviously had an abusive relationship. So he already before. Had suffered a bit of abuse. And- yeah. Um, he was told that no one had tried to kill him. It was all in his mind. Um, he was put on antidepressants and nerve tablets, which just helped block things out even more. He said that he lost about six or eight months of his life just walking around full of tranquilizers, thinking it was all in his head. Wow. So even though, I mean, obviously, you know, you wouldn't want to get murdered, but he still suffered a great deal then. Uh, yeah. Stuff, and like, the docu- I watched a documentary that he was in it. That's where I sort of got that from about the, the memories and stuff. And you can just tell, even just talking about it. I mean, I don't know when the documentary was filmed. It still looked quite old, so maybe nineties or something like that. It was maybe filmed. Yeah. Um, but he was still kind of, you know, tearing up and you know getting upset just talking about it. And yeah. So he must have. He, he must. Um, what's the word? Like maybe PTSD. Is that the right word for it? No. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. maybe because. How do you go through that and... Well, exactly. And then, and then probably knowing what he knows now, like, oh about God. about the guy, I mean, that must he, be even... He also, he might, yeah, he might feel guilty. He might have survivor's guilt because, like, because he survived and all these other victims died as well. You know, that yeah. is a thing, you That's know, survivor's true. guilt. I mean, the poor guy. I mean, you I could, you, you felt for him when you were yeah. watching the documentary. You did feel for, for him. Yeah, what a shame. Yeah. So, um, in 19... Oh, no... In September 1982, Nelson met a 27-year-old man called Graham Allen when he was trying to flag down a taxi. Um, Nelson invited Graham home for a meal. Graham was eating an omelette and Nelson strangled him. Nice. Could have let him eat his dinner. <sighs> he put his body in the bath and it stayed there for three days before Nelson dissected it on the kitchen floor. So he never had a bath for three days that, because there was a body in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, no, I obviously didn't. <laughs> Did not have a, maybe had a shower as well. Ah, but this is back in the eighties. I mean, like back yeah. in the eighties, yeah, we didn't have a shower. No, it was more like baths, wasn't it? Yeah, we we had we had a, um because we lived in England. I don't know if it's a thing down there, but I've never seen anything like up here, um, in Scotland. But we actually had a bath and a sink in one room, and then the toilet was in a separate room. All oh, right, okay. But when we moved here in ni- when did we move here? Nineteen eighty six. Eighty six. Then we had a shower, but we had a separate shower. Mm-hmm. We had the shower room, yeah, and then a bathroom. That's so, right, yeah. yeah, I mean, like back then, I mean, I don't think a lot of people did have showers. Yeah. So, he might have, but then, but it'd be, I would assume it'd be very rare to have a bath and a shower. Yeah. I mean, you might have a a shower over your bath. Yeah, maybe. So then he couldn't have had a shower either because there was a body in the bath. What did he get? I don't know. Um, on 26th of January 1983 Nelson killed his final victim 20 year old are you sure this is yes. the final victim well according to this yeah I mean there might be others I don't know <laughs> um, his final victim was 20 year old Stephen Sinclair Stephen had fallen asleep in an armchair at Nelson's flat after taking drugs and drinking alcohol Nelson strangled him and then put him in the bath and washed him and then put him on the bed and lay next to him naked and fell asleep when he later dissected the body, he stored parts in wardrobes and drawers. He attempted to d- to dispose 
of the uh, flesh, internal organs and smaller bones of all three victims killed at Cranley Gardens by flushing them down the toilet. Mm -hmm. um, and as he had also done at his previous address, he boiled heads, hands and feet to remove the flesh of these sections of the victims' bodies. That's just vile. It is. Uh, uh, like, like you must have a really strong st stomach to actually be able to do that. Well... As a, going back to the very short interview that I watched last night, he said that. Um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought there. What was I saying? <laughs> About the documentary you watched last night. Yeah, he said that he would drink. He would have to drink um, when he was uh, dissecting the bodies, or you know, whatever he boil and whatever he was doing, and then he would maybe go off and outside and be sick. Right. And then come back. So it did affect him. Yeah. But clearly not enough to stop him from doing it. Um, so, on the 4th of February 1983, Nelson wrote a letter of complaint to a state agents complaining that the drains were blocked. So a Dino Rod employee, Michael Catran, arrived on the 8th of February in response to the complaints of Nelson and other tenants. He opened a drain cover at the side of the house and discovered it was packed with a flesh-like substance and small bones. So he reported it to his supervisor, Gary Wheeler, but as he had arrived at the property quite late in the day, they decided to investigate further the next morning. Right. Before leaving, Michael Catan had a conversation with Nelson and another tenant called Jim Alcock about the substance. When Michael said it was similar in appearance to human flesh, Nelson said... It looks like someone has been flushing down their Kentucky Fried Chicken. That's a bit of a random description, but okay. So the next morning, Michael Catran and his supervisor, Gary Wheeler, returned to Cranley Gardens at 7.30. Um, and, uh, but the drain had been cleared. Right. Oh. <laughs> Michael discovered some bits of flesh and four bones in a pipe leading from the drain which linked to the top flat of the house. Surprise, surprise. Surprise, yeah. That's what um, it is. To both men, the bones looked like they had came from a human hand. Right. Um, they called the police and they found more small bones and bits of flesh in the same pipe. They were sent to the mortuary and it was confirmed that the remains were human. Yeah. So the police waited outside the house until Nelson came home from work. As soon as they entered his flat, they could smell rotting flesh. I hate, I, I hate I mean, to think. I how could he actually even live with that, though, himself? I mean, again, like... Maybe he smells it. it. <laughs> I mean, I've, I mean, I've, I've never, never smelled... Yeah. I've, yeah, I've never smelled rotten flesh, but from, you know, the stories and people's accounts of it, it obviously well, isn't a very, very nice smell, so... Yeah, when you see, like, maybe on TV and stuff like that, you see people, like, being sick and, like, you know... Yeah, passing out because it's that bad so to actually live with that I have no idea No. Um, at first Nelson acted surprised when they told him the train the drains were blocked with human remains but he was told by the police don't mess about where's the rest of the body so they obviously were thinking yeah. it is something to do with you Yeah. <laughs> Nelson then told them that the remainder of the body could be found in two plastic bags in a nearby wardrobe he was then asked if there were any other body parts to be found, to which he replied, quote, It's a long story. It goes back a long time. I'll tell you everything. I want to get it off my chest. Not here at the police station, end quote. So he was arrested on suspicion of murder. Right. <laughs> bit time. I was going to say, yeah, <laughs> about time. Um, later that day, uh, the police removed the plastic bags from the wardrobe and took them to the mortuary. One bag had two dissected torsos in it, and a shopping bag contained various internal organs. The second bag had a human skull in it with almost no flesh on it, a severed head and a torso with arms attached, but the hands were missing. Oh my God, that um, is both, awful. I know. Both heads were found to, be, to have been subjected to moist heat. So I'm assuming that's because he was boiling them. Right, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, on the 10th of February, Nelson confessed that there were more human remains in a tea chest in his living room and more remains inside an upturned drawer in his bathroom. The dismembered body parts were the bodies of three men who he had strangled. Oh. The police just went in thinking it was just one man. 
Yeah, <laughs> little did they know it was a lot more than that. One victim, he didn't know his name. Another, he knew as only John the Guardsman. And the third, he identified as Stephen Sinclair. He also stated that beginning December 1978, he had killed 12 or 13 men at his previous address, 195 Melrose Avenue. Mm-hmm. He also admitted to unsuccessfully attempting to kill approximately seven other people oh, wow. who had either escaped or on one occasion had been at the brink of death but had been revived and allowed to leave. Which would be the... Uh, um, Carl. Carl. Yeah. <clears throat> A further search for additional remains at 23... 23- Cranley Gardens on the 10th of February revealed the lower section of a torso and two legs in the bathroom a skull, a section of torso and various bones in the tea chest. You're just sitting there shaking your head. I'm like it's, it, is, it is quite unbelievable I know, it's awful. Yeah it's just, it's just how can you live with like just random body parts lying about your house? Well, I know, it's like it's, it's like it's just part of your furniture, and it's just, like, no. It's, it's, it is absolutely awful. I mean, it was a monster, yeah, really. Yeah, absolutely, definitely was a monster. Um, so the same day, Nelson went with the police to his previous address at Melrose Avenue, where he showed them the three places in the back garden where he had burned the remains of his victims. Mm-hmm. Investigators discovered over a thousand fragments of bone from the garden, many of them blackened and charred by fire. So under English law, the police had 48 hours in, either, in which to either charge Nelson or release him. Mm-hmm. Um, putting together the remains of the victims killed at Cranley Gardens on the floor of the mortuary, Professor Bowen was able to confirm that the fingerprints on one body matched police files of Stephen Sinclair. Right. So at 5.40pm on the 11th of February, Nelson was charged with Stephen's murder. Just one murder? Right. So far. Um, police interviewed Nelson on 16 separate occasions over the following days, which totaled over 30 hours. When he was asked what his motive for the murders was, mm-hmm. he just said, quote, I'm hoping you will tell me that, end quote. <laughs> I don't know how he expected anybody else. To... Well, I was just going to say, how do they know? <laughs> maybe he was wanting a psychiatrist to... Well, maybe. I don't know. Uh, yeah, to be fair, he was obviously very sick and twisted mm. and... He also said that the decision to kill wasn't made until moments before the act of murder. Which I don't believe because, well, why are you bringing all these men back to your flat? Well, I could understand maybe like the first time it Mm. might have been impulsive. But then once you've done it a few times, I mean, you obviously are aware that you've done it before. You're bringing these people back to the same scenarios so yeah, I don't know. You're not going to have made that decision in split seconds, really. Well, I mean... I mean, it, it could be, but he, if he's invited somebody back to his flat, then maybe he is thinking, well, I don't know, I, I might kill him, I might not. Yeah, true. Maybe that's what's in his thought. Well, I'm going to bring this man back, yeah. we'll see how we get on, and then I might kill him or I might not. But if he knows that he might kill somebody, then he shouldn't be inviting them back to his well, flat. Well, exactly, because he's putting himself... So to me, the intent's still there. Yeah, because that... he's putting himself in that situation yeah. where he knows that there's a possibility that it could happen. Yeah, exactly. So so even if he hasn't quite fully made up his mind, there's, yeah, you know, exactly. the, he obviously knows that there's a you know, a chance that he might do it. So no, he should, well, but then clearly he wanted to do it because <laughs> he kept <laughs> doing it. <laughs> So, um, and then what, if, if this is him telling them, that once the victim had been killed, he typically bathed the victim's body, shaved any hair from the torso, then applied makeup to any obvious blemishes upon the skin. The body was usually dressed in socks and underpants, and he talked to the corpses. Oh, I knew I'd read that somewhere. Mm. Um, he, would, he would often masturbate next to them, but he never penetrated them. He said his victims were, quote, too perfect and beautiful for the pathetic ritual of commonplace sex, end quote. When asked why the heads found at Cranley Gardens had been subjected to moist heat, Nelson stated that he had boiled the heads of his victims in a large cooking pot so that the internal contents evaporated and he wouldn't have to dispose of the brain and flesh. Is that really what happens? Not that I really feel what, what, you're that. me like because that's what I do. No, no, but I didn't know that that's what happens. I didn't know that it your, must do. Your brain, so your brain would evaporate. Is that what we're saying well, here? Well, <laughs> yeah, that's what he's saying. Whether it's whether that's just what he thought, maybe, or whether that's actually what happens. Yes, yeah, so we're, we're not scientists, so that's not scientifically proven. <laughs> <No>. But 
If you want to know, just Google. Yes. <laughs> the, um, the torsos and limbs of the three victims killed at this address were dissected within a week or so of their murder, then wrapped in plastic bags and put in the three locations he had told the police. He had flushed the internal organs and smaller bones down the toilet. This was the only method he could consider to dispose of the internal organs, organs and soft tissue as he had no exclusive use of the garden like he had at his previous address. Right. He was asked if he had any remorse for his crimes and he said, quote, I wished I could stop, but I couldn't. I had no other thrill or happiness, end quote. He also said that he took no pleasure from the act of killing, but worshipped the art and the act of death. Okay, that just sounds... So, here's a quick rundown of the victims in order, uh -huh. right? So, in 1978, there was um, the 30th of December, Stephen Holmes, age 14, uh, strangled and drowned in a bucket of water. His body remained beneath Nelson's floorboards for over seven months before being disposed of on a bonfire. Mm -hmm. Stephen was the only victim not to have been dissected before disposal right and his remains were identified in november 2006 mm -hmm. so 1979 the 3rd of december kenneth ockenden age 23 but the, another report said he was actually 26 um a canadian student strangled with headphone wire while listening to music 1980 so there, there was a bit of a gap between those because um, the first one was the 30th of December 1978 and then the next one wasn't until the 3rd of December the following oh, okay. year so that's mm -hmm. nearly a year uh -huh. and then 1980 that was from December to May so that was a few months mm -hmm. um, was um, the 17th of May was Martin Duffy age 16 mm -hmm. he was strangled and drowned in the kitchen sink and two days later placed beneath the floorboards and then the same year the 20th of August William Sutherland age 26 he was a father of one originally from Edinburgh who worked occasionally as a male prostitute. Um, Nelson couldn't remember exactly how he had murdered William other than he strangled him and in the morning there was another dead body. So he must have been really drunk. Yeah. Um, this is the same year again. September, unidentified. All that Nelson could remember about his fifth victim was that he was an Irish labourer with rough hands who wore an old suit and jacket and, thought, and he thought he was between 27 and 30. He later said he had made this one up. Oh, so all right. Who knows? Um, October the next month, October, um, unidentified. His sixth victim was a male prostitute, aged between twenty and thirty, and was either Filipino or Mexican, according to Nelson. Right. The following month, November, mm -hmm. unidentified. Um, Nelson said this victim was homeless, and he found him sleeping in a doorway at the top of Charing Cross Road. He was skinny, pale, and had missing teeth. Nelson took him home and strangled him. Lovely. Um, November or December, unidentified. Um, Nelson described him as an English long-haired hippie, between age between twenty-five and thirty. Um, this victim's body was kept beneath the floorboards of his flat until Nelson removed the corpse, cut it into three pieces, then put the dissected remains back beneath the floorboards. He burned the pieces a year later, but he later complained to me. He claimed to have made that one up as well. So. We He's made some of these up, so... Well, from what... The, I'm sure that was actually in the, in that short interview as well. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he said something... I couldn't quite understand him. Right. Even though he's Scottish, I couldn't really understand oh, really? him. The sound wasn't that great. Right. Um, and I think he said that because he'd said to the police in the police car on the way to the police station that he thought he'd murdered round about... I don't know what he'd said, 16 or 17 or something like that, mm -hmm. that he just kind of made these up to round up the, the number, well, where, where it's yeah. actually less than that. But right. So, who knows? I mean, how can you trust well, yeah. a murderer? I guess if, if there's quite a few unidentified and you've burnt the remainder stuff, I mean, I guess you're never really going to truly know the, the, the mm -hmm. true amount. So then we're on to January of 1981. So it's, basically, it's been like every month. Yeah. Um, the 4th of January, unidentified, Nelson said this victim was an 18-year-old blue-eyed Scot who wore a green tracksuit top and trainers. The body of this victim was dissected on the 12th of January. February, unidentified, Nelson didn't remember much about this victim except he was originally from Belfast, was slim, about five foot nine, was in his early twenties. He was strangled and placed beneath the floorboards. April, unidentified. Nelson described him as a muscular English skinhead who was about twenty. 
He had a tattoo on his neck saying cut here. Nelson hung this victim's naked torso in his bedroom for 24 hours before placing him beneath the, the floorboards. But, again, he claimed to have made that one up. Oh, right, okay. But it's a bit strange that he had that detail of he hung yeah. the naked torso in his bedroom. Like, So I take it, like, none of these victims that he's given a description of were never... Was, yeah, that's what I was saying, unidentified. Yeah, so they were never... They've not been identified. Still haven't been identified. Still haven't been identified. Yeah. So people that had had missing family members or whatever, they've never been matched up to. No. Right. Um, 18th of September, Mal- Malcolm Barlow, age 23. This was the final victim to, call- to be killed at Melrose Avenue. Before Nelson dis- dissected his body, he had put him in a kitchen uh, cupboard as he had run out of space under the floorboards by this time. Cool. Uh, the next year, 1982, March, John Howler, age 23. He was strangled as he slept in Nelson's bed, with Nelson shouting, It's about time you went. As John awoke to find himself being strangled, he then drowned him in the bathtub. Nelson dismembered the body, flushed portions of flesh and internal organs down the toilet and put various large bones out with the rubbish. September, Graham Allen... Alan, even, aged 27. Graham was a father of one, originally from Motherwell, another Scottish one. Mm-hmm. Um, he was strangled while eating an omelette. His body was identified from dental records and healed fractured, fractures to his jawbone. Dissected portions of flesh and small bones from the body of Graham blocked the drains at Cranley Gardens. Following year 1983. We're getting there. We're nearly say, finished. Please stop. <laughs> 26th of January. Stephen Sinclair, age 20, was Nelson's final victim. Right. Um, he strangled him. The head, upper torso and arms of Stephen were kept in the tea chest in the living room and his lower torso and legs were kept underneath the bathtub. So, on the 11th of February 1983, Nelson was officially charged with the murder of Stephen Sinclair. Mm-hmm. He was transferred to Brixton Prison to be held on remand until his trial. He objected to wearing a prison uniform whilst on remand. He said he was going to protest by wearing no clothes, so he wasn't allowed to leave his cell. Oh, so he just was naked all the time then? <laughs> yeah, so. right. or he obviously didn't like being on remand. Right. Um, on the 1st of August, he threw the contents of his chamber pot out of his cell, hitting some of the prison officers. So, yeah, that was nice. Lovely. He was f- found guilty of assault on prison officers on the 9th of August and spent 56 days in solitary confinement. Right. 56 days, that's quite a lot to be in solitary. Yeah, because yeah. that's what... That's nearly that's a bit two months. months. Nearly well, two right. months. Yeah, yeah, nearly two months, yeah. That's a long time just to be, well, on your own, sitting mm. in a room with nothing to do, I'd imagine. Probably when he clays on. Well, no, yeah. So, <laughs> um, he stood trial at the Old Bailey on five counts of murder and two of attempted murder. A sixth murder, murder charge was later added. Initially, he had intended to plead guilty to each charge of murder. His solicitor had fully prepared his defence... But five weeks before the trial, Nelson decided to hire someone else instead who advised him to plead not guilty by diminished responsibility. All right. So the primary dispute between the prosecuting and the defence counsel was not, like, whether Nelson had committed the murder, but the state of his mind before, during and after the murders. Right, okay. And the prosecuting counsel, Alan Green, argued that Nelson was sane, Mm -hmm. had full control of his actions, and had killed with premeditation, which, yes, I agree with that. Yes, I definitely Um, agree with that. The defence counsel, Ivan Lawrence, argued that Nelson suffered from diminished responsibility and should be convicted of manslaughter instead of murder. No, don't agree with you, Ivan Lawrence. No, I do not agree with that. <laughs> um, the prosecution counsel opened the case for the Crown by describing the discovery of three dismembered bodies in Nelson's flat, his arrest, his confession... Him leading investigators to where he had burned the other bodies at Melrose Avenue and how he had tried to cover up his crimes. In the closing speech, it was told that Nelson had asked, he was asked at the police station if he needed to kill. Um, his response was, quote, at the precise moment of the act, meaning the murder, I believe I am right in doing the act, end quote. Very strange man, yeah, isn't he? Is very strange. And he added that, quote, Mm-hmm. The the Crown says that even if there was mental abnormality, that was not sufficient to diminish his responsibility for these killings, end quote. No. I don't <laughs> care what anybody says on that. He was a sick, twisted, vile, 
definitely. But, but well, if you think about just there was nothing indicating it either. Like the, I don't know. Just it just seems all like he intended to do. He lured these people back to his flat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he did. He definitely. He knew what he was doing. Yeah, I would say. You so. know, it's not as if he was just out and about, bumped into somebody and killed them. No. You know. The, the, the intent was there. There was there's no diminished responsibility. He no. knew what he was doing. Really, and then, and then the fact that you've kept the bodies, you've played about with them, then you've chopped them up. To me, it's not somebody that oh, I've just killed somebody. Oh my god, I need to like I need phone the, yeah. or I need to phone the police and like yeah. tell them that I've done it. You know, it yeah, was... or, or cover it up or whatever. You know, he's he, you know he's kept them almost as some kind of trophy and and then dispose of them at his leisure. <laughs> really. Which I think, you know, to me, that's somebody that clearly, I'm not saying I don't know if enjoy is the right words, but certainly, I don't know, liked it enough to do it over and over again. Yeah. So, the first witness to testify for the pros- prosecution was Douglas Stewart. He said that he had woken up in Nelson's flat to find his ankles bound and Nelson strangling him. Douglas managed to overpower Nelson. And Nelson shouted, take my money. Um, this reflected Nelson's rational, cool presence of mind and that he hoped to be heard by his neighbours. Like, he was obviously um, trying to convince people that he was the victim and that right, he was okay. being robbed. Yeah, yeah. Um, Douglas reported the attack to the police and Nelson was questioned, but it was dismissed as a lover's tiff. Um, The defence counsel tried to undermine Douglas's credibility, pointing out minor inconsistencies in the testimony Um the fact that he'd been very drunk and that his memory had been se- selectively magnified as he has previously sold his story to the press. Right, okay. so. But then that's the jury's job of the defence, is it? They're always going to try and discredit witnesses and stuff, so... Did you say the jury? I meant the defence. <laughs> um, on the 25th of October, the court heard testimonies from two men who had survived Nelson's attempts to strangle them. The first one, uh, Paul Nobbs, pr- provided testimony which the prosecution said proved Nelson's self-control and ability to stop himself from killing. Which is true, like, he, he has managed to stop himself. So, yeah. this thing about, like, sort of impulse and stuff like that, again, it's like, but you can stop yourself. No, so. exactly. So, clearly, you don't have to actually do it. You've chosen to do it. Yeah, exactly. You know, you know the you can... choice is there. You, you're you just not like, oh, I have to do this. I've started, so I have to finish kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um, so Paul, Paul had went back to Nelson's flat for alcohol and sex. He woke up with a terrible headache in the early hours and his eyes were bloodshot. He also noted a mark on his neck. He had went to the doctor and was told that it looked like somebody had tried to strangle him. Um, he didn't report the attack as he didn't want his sexuality to be discovered. No, I never um, about that. Yeah, fair enough. You know, there's a theme there, like back there, this, this is, that, that was the problem. Like people did you know try to keep it a, a yeah, secret exactly. you know they did want it they didn't want people to know because well, it wasn't really accepted back then was it it was i know um, but i mean it's awful because you know if people feel like they can't uh, uh, um, report an attack just you know because because they're so scared that people are going to out them as being yeah, yeah. That, it's awful isn't it i, I mean it really is i mean mm. phew, each to their own like just, you know you should be able to just it's you should, well, love is love, as they say these well, days. Well, yeah, exactly. You know, but obviously, back then it was all different. I know. At least I, I'd like to think that that these days that people wouldn't be scared to report a crime because of their sexuality. Yeah. But I, don't I know, mean, unless you're in that position, I guess it's hard to yeah to know what yeah. what you would do. I don't know it's just horrible. Like that, yeah. you know, as you say, you should be able to love whoever the hell you want to love, and oh, you shouldn't be ashamed of it or definitely not have to keep it a secret or. Whatever. Mm, but back in those days, it was a very, very different world. Yeah. Um, contrary to the prosecution claims, the defence counsel asserted that Nobbs' testimony reflected Nelson's rather self being unable to control his impulses. Um, the fact Nelson had selected a university student as a potential victim was at odds with the prosecution's claim that Nelson intentionally selected r- rootless males whose disappearance was unlikely to be noticed. Carl not eh, Carl Notter? <laughs> Sorry, Carl. Carl Stotter was next on the stand and told the court how in May 1982 Nelson had attempted to strangle and drown him before bringing him back to life. DCIJ then told the court about Nelson's arrest and his calm, matter-of-fact confessions and he read several statements made by Nelson to the court. 
In one of these statements, Nelson had said, quote, I have no tears for my victims, I have no tears for myself, nor those bereaved by my actions, end quote. So, so he, he doesn't just, feel... He had no emotion. Yeah, nothing he for... He just didn't care, really. Definitely didn't show any remorse then. No. Jay admitted that it was unusual for anyone accused of such horrific crimes to be so forthcoming in providing information mm -hmm. and answer, answered upon questioning by the Defence Council that Nelson not only provided most of the evidence against himself, uh -huh. but he also encouraged the discovery of evidence which could contradict his own version of events. All right. Yeah, so it's... I don't, maybe yeah. he wanted punished. Maybe. Maybe he did. Maybe he did feel something. And he, or maybe he just knew that he needed to be punished or he knew that he needed to be stopped. Maybe yeah. he didn't actually feel something. Yeah. But maybe he just knew, right, this has to stop. Aye, this is enough's enough now. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Um, following Jay's testimony, uh, DS Chambers recited Nelson's formal confession to the court. The testimony included graphic descriptions of the ritualistic and sexual acts Nelson performed with his victims' bodies, his various methods of storing the bodies, dismemberment and disposal, and the problems that decomp decomposition, particularly regarding colonies of maggots, afforded him. Oh, God, Ugh. just think maggots. Oh. Yep. Um, several jurors were visibly shaken throughout the testimony. I'm not surprised. And others just looked at Nelson with pure shock on their faces. That would be you. Yeah, you're yeah. looking at pure shock at me. I know, I'm like, <laughs> I can't believe somebody can actually do this. It's... Um, but he just listened, listened with apparent indifference. He just, nothing, yeah. you know, no emotion on his face or no. whatever. Um, two psychiatrists uh, testified on behalf of the defence. Dr James McKeith began his testimony on the 26th of October. He testified to how, through a lack of emotional development, Nelson experienced difficulty expressing any emotion, obviously, other than anger, and his tendency to treat other human beings as components of his fantasies. Um, the psychiatrist also described Nelson's association between unconscious bodies and sexual arousal, mm -hmm. stating that Nelson possessed narcissistic tra traits, an impaired sense of identity, and was able to depersonalise other people. Which, of it, you'd have to. Oh, well, surely, yeah. yeah. You would definitely have to. Um, he stated his conclusions that Nelson displayed many signs of maladapt maladaptive... Um, I had to. <laughs> Obviously, I had to look that I was one up. Say, what does that mean? Um, it means that you don't adapt well to the environment that you're in. Oh, okay. Um, so, it, um, so he stated his conclusions that Nelson displayed many signs of maladaptive behaviour, the combination of which in one man was lethal. Right. Um, these factors could be attributed to an unspecified response to the prosecution contention that in attributing an unspecified disorder to Nelson, McKeith was undecided in his conclusions. Ma McKeith, McKeith contended that his unspecified dis personality disorder was severe enough to substantially reduce Nelson's responsibility. Now, can you tell that that wasn't my words? I was just going to say that was a bit of a mouthful. And I think you were struggling to even exactly. say that. So. that. That was not my words. For that. anybody that's listening... <laughs> You might not have got that. No, I'm sorry, but I basically couldn't put that in my own words, so just wrote down what I read, yeah. basically. Sometimes you just gotta. Yeah. So hopefully it will make sense to people. If not, I apologise. Yeah, if not, forget that. We kind of got the story. Um, I think when it comes to, like, court stuff... like Yeah, the technical but, terms. And, yeah, yeah, and, like, obviously I've never been in that position where I've never been to court I've never no we're angels yeah exactly <laughs> perfectly well behaved you know I, I, I've never been a witness but you know I've, yeah so all this some of this stuff is completely like, jargon to yeah, me. yeah so no I agree yeah th this the next bit's the same <laughs> okay so prepare yourself everybody this could at least be... I'm honest yeah at least I am honest I'm not true. claiming to have written this myself no so the second psychiatrist to testify for the defense Dr. Patrick Galway diagnosed Nelson with a borderline false self as if pseudonormal narcissistic personality disorder with occasional outbreaks of schizoid disturbances that Nelson managed most of the time to keep at bay. Okay. Sorry about that. No idea what that means. But <laughs> I okay. sort of got it. He can keep his stuff. 
like tendencies maybe the yeah he, he can manage it most mm-hmm. of the time he can manage it yeah um galway stated that in episodic <laughs> breakdowns i'm sorry <laughs> just like <laughs> um nelson became predominant predominantly schizoid acting in an impulsive violent and sudden manner Galway further added that someone suffering from these episodic breakdowns is most likely to disintegrate under circumstances of social isolation. <sighs> this well, is hard. This is hard work. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. In effect, Nelson was not guilty of malice aforethought. So that's what one psychiatrist is saying. And to me that's like, so he's saying that he, but like, not get malice, like, so he's saying he was not guilty of thinking it all out, like yeah, well yeah, premeditation basically. Mm. Don't don't like that. No, I don't think I agree with that, doctor. No. Um, a, upon cross examination, Alan Green largely largely focused upon the degree of awareness shown by Nelson and his ability to make decisions. Galway agreed that Nelson was intellect intellectually aware of his actions, but stressed that due to his personality disorder. Nelson did not appreciate the criminal nature of his actions. See, I don't agree mm. with that. I, he did appreciate the criminal nature of his actions, I think. Mm-hmm. That's my opinion. Mm-hmm. Because when the police came, he basically just went, opened his mouth and just... Told them. Yeah, like just like his belly rumble, basically. Yeah. It all came spewing out. So, yeah. And as I said before, I think he knows that he, he needs to be punished. He needs to be stopped. Yeah, well, exactly. So, because why... I mean, to be fair he didn't have to tell them about the other victims because, mm. you know, the ones that are unidentified, the ones that they burned, I mean, he could have probably just... He could have just denied yeah, a lot of stuff. Yeah, you know, exactly. So he, he was must very have, forthcoming, as they said. Um, so he must have, you know, he's obviously aware that he has, well, of course, done very, very wrong. Yeah, so I think he did appreciate the criminal nature of his actions. Like, yeah. yeah, I would say more yeah, so that that's than, obviously than just not. our opinion but yes of course um, on the 31st October the prosecution called Dr Paul Bowden to dis- to disprove the psychiatrist who had testified for the defence we could have put us on the stand we could have done that I know <laughs> um, <laughs> I told you that after hearing that story <laughs> prior to Nelson's trial Bowden had interviewed the defendant on 16 separate occasions and interviews totaling over 14 hours over two days Dr. Bowden d- testified that he found Nelson to be a manipulative person who had been capable of forming relationships but had forced himself to o- objectify people. Bowden f- further testified he found no evidence of maladaptive behaviour and that Nelson suffered from no disorder of the mind. Mm-hmm. See, now I, d- I agree with that, Doctor. Yeah, from hearing the story, to me it sounds like he was fully aware of what he was mm-hmm. doing you know he was manipulative yeah you know the, the whole objective thing i mean the fact that he had them like sitting in chairs and stuff like that yeah i totally agree yeah. with that opinion i totally agree with that so yeah. following the closing arguments of both the prosecution and the defense the jury retired to consider their verdict on the 3rd of november 1983 the following day the jury returned with a majority verdict of guilty on uh, six counts of murder and one of attempted murder, with a unanimous verdict of guilty in relation to the attempted murder of Paul Nobbs. Um, Dennis Nelson was sentenced to life imprisonment with a recommendation that he serve a minimum of 25 years imprisonment. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, no. I, I just do not get these punishments. No. Um, and then if he's on, <laughs> if he, like, well... I was going to say, if good behaviour, I mean, maybe if not, if, if you've got to serve a minimum, but, you know, sometimes these people get sentenced to a certain amount and then they're out and sometimes half that yeah. time because of good behaviour or whatever. Yeah. But, but I, I mean, mean, to me, he doesn't deserve to be out. Like, he does not deserve to ever have a chance of freedom no, ever again. Like, definitely not. Life not. should mean life. Yeah, in that case, yeah, definitely. Um, he was sent to Wormwood Scrubs to begin his sentence. As a Category A prisoner, he was assigned his own cell and could mix freely with other inmates. In December 1983, Nelson was cut on the face and chest with a razor blade by an inmate called Albert Moffat, resulting in injuries needing 89 stitches. <laughs> um, afterwards, he was briefly transferred to Parkhurst Prison, then Wakefield Prison, where he remained until 1990. In 1991, he was transferred to a vulnerable prisoner um, unit. And, um, and oh, I've written down until it should have been unit. I, 
Vulnerable Prisoner Unit at Phil Sutton Prison because there were concerns for his safety. He remained there until 1993, where he was transferred to Whitemere Prison again as a Category A prisoner um, and with increased segregation from other inmates. So people clearly got wind of what he'd done and... Yeah, or maybe they just didn't like him. Well, that's true. <laughs> um, the minimum term set, um, of 25 years to life imprisonment to which Nelson was sentenced in 1983 was replaced by a whole life tariff oh, right, um, okay. by Home Secretary Michael Howard in December 1994. Right. This ruling made sure he would never be released from prison. Good. So, I'm yeah. glad about that. Um, in 2003... Uh, Nelson was again transferred to HMP Phil Sutton, where he remained incarcerated as a Category A prisoner. In the prison workshop, he translated books in Braille. He spent much of his time reading and writing and was allowed to paint and compose music on a keyboard. He also exchanged letters with numerous people who wrote to him. Why would you write to him? Serial killers have fans. Really? Yeah. Like, no, I mean, the likes of, like, you know, like, Ted Bundy and things like that. They do. They yeah. have fans. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's sick. Yeah. <laughs> um, he remained at HMP Full Sutton until his death on the 12th of May, 2018. Oh, Nailuck. so he only died a couple of years ago, then. Yep. He died in his cell. He was in excruciating pain for hours with internal bleeding. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. He deserved that. Oh, Sorry, yeah. but he did. Uh, no, not sorry, actually. Um, two days before that, he had been taken to hospital with abdominal pains. Right. He had an operation, but later suffered a blood clot. Mm-hmm. He spent his final hours lying in his own filth as he suffered a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. Well, as bad as it sounds bad, but I have no sympathy. Right, so basically that, that was the episode finished. But uh-huh. last night, as I said, I was on YouTube uh-huh. and I watched a documentary and it was called Surviving Dennis Nelson, I think that's what it was called. And yeah. it actually had Carl Stotter. Uh-huh. Um, he was on it. Um, as I said before, like that's how he, I could see he was upset. Blah, yeah. blah, blah. But, get this. He had a boyfriend. What? <laughs> he had a boyfriend? Yep. Okay. <laughs> he, so uh, this is the little extra bit that I wrote last night. Uh-huh. Um, he met this guy called Martin Hunter Craig in May 1979. Right. Um, Martin was 19. He was drifting in uh, jobs in people's beds as he was homeless. So he was just going from guy to guy, you know. Right, okay. Um, they went for drinks. Um, Nelson invited him back for coffee. This was actually not long after he'd killed his first victim. So that's right, how so far back it was. Right, so he'd already killed somebody. Yeah, he'd already killed one person. Mm-hmm. Um, they spent the night together and then they started a casual relationship which actually lasted right up until Nelson's arrest. So I wonder why... Um, so, so these, why was he different then? I mean, why... I have no idea. Why was he not... Well, know? he said, on the documentary, he said that he just stood up to him. Um, you know, like, he didn't put up with his shit, basically. And, yeah. you know, he would answer him back. He would... Mm. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Um, but when Nelson moved to Cranley Gardens, he asked Martin to move in with him. Mm-hmm. but Martin refused he said he didn't love him and he knew he never would love him mm-hmm. um, he just, and he didn't want to settle down with him he was he was happy just with a sort of one-off relationship yeah. just casual uh-huh. um, and he said he couldn't drink with how much Nelson drank and the silliness of when he was drunk like he would just like collapse and play dead and Martin said he really didn't know what Nelson expected him to do mm-hmm. um, but he said it was, that, that wasn't, wasn't his thing no it yeah. wasn't for him um, but when Martin went to vi- visit Nelson in his new flat he noticed the smell and he actually said to Nelson, that, se- that smell seems to follow you about. You know, it was at Melrose Gardens. Yeah. It's uh-huh. here now. It's like a really musty smell. Uh-huh. And he said Nelson just laughed it off. But little did Martin know he was actually surrounded by body parts. Oh, God, yeah. Um, and four days before Nelson was caught, Martin had went, went, went to his flat. Mm-hmm. And he actually interrupted him, trying to dispose of his last Oh, victim. my God. Really? Yeah. And he said it had taken Nelson a while to answer the door. Mm-hmm. And when he did, he was flustered and like told Martin he couldn't come in, which was unusual because he was, he was always happy and welcome. And like, every time Martin yeah. went, you know... Well, there'd be no, no, no reason why, why yeah. he wouldn't come in the house, yeah. Um, so Nelson, say, Nelson had said he was too busy and things had gone wrong that day so I, I don't know what that meant I don't uh-huh. know what went wrong yeah. because he hadn't been caught yet so yeah. um, but just at that moment like uh, Nelson's dog had crept through his legs and like ran down the stairs right so 
he asked, he said to Martin, you know, mind the door so that the door didn't shut and lock them out. Yeah. Um, so, so Martin just held the door open while he went and got the dog. Uh-huh. But it's luckily Martin didn't go into the flat because he would have probably seen the body and Nelson might have killed him. You know, oh, if yeah. he'd seen... If, yeah, because if he'd seen too much, he might have been like, yeah. right, I need to kill you now. And, um, like, Mar- but poor Martin, I mean, he had a hard time after Nelson's arrest because um, the, pr- the press hounded him. Mm-hmm. Um, ba- basically, there was a guy. Um, I think he said it was like from was it ITN News or something like that. Right. I'd just been going around the pubs and things like that, just like interviewing anybody that may have came across mm-hmm. Nelson. Mm-hmm. And he, um, Martin, actually spoke to him, so he was on the news. Right. Okay. Um, and because obviously he was gay, uh-huh. that he was outed as yeah. being gay, uh-huh. and so the the press, the they weren't very nice to him. You know, they saw being gay as taboo. Uh huh. Um, and he, you know, at this time. Martin had said that him and his family, I mean, his family knew that he was gay, mm-hmm. but they wanted to keep it a secret. They yeah, right, okay. One people knowing, you yeah. know, as we know about that time. Uh-huh. Um, so, yeah, so he had to put up with that, you know, we've been outed. Right. And the press not being very nice about him and, like, sort of demonising him and things like that. And because uh-huh. he'd been in a relationship for so long with Nelson, they implied that he was involved. Yeah, so he so had, like, no clue. He had no clue whatsoever. I mean... Wow. Well. How? As as Carl Stotter had actually said in the documentary earlier on as well, he had noticed the smell. Mm-hmm. But he said it was like a musty smell, which is what Martin had said as well. But he said that um, if because he'd never neither of them had smelled death before, no. so they didn't know that's what yeah. it was. Uh-huh. And Carl, he had said that maybe it was you know maybe he had a dog, so maybe it was like dog food had went off or yeah. you know he was kind of making excuses. Ah, yeah, it could thinking be. it's not yeah, not thinking for one minute that it was yeah. So obviously Martin had noticed that, mm-hmm. but as I, I don't think as I said it was a really casual relationship, so I don't think yeah, maybe like, maybe I never actually spent that much yeah, time. Yeah, I was gonna say maybe it's not like they spent like every day together. Maybe yeah. it's maybe maybe once a week. But or I mean, something. would you not be absolutely petrified that? He might find something like if he's just going to go into the bathroom or, well, or yeah. open the cupboard. I know, but maybe he was that confident that he didn't. Yeah, but yeah, he didn't know, but he had no idea. But he said that people turned against him, mm-hmm. and um, even his own mum went cold on him, and that was it. Right up, up until she died, like their relationship was oh, completely well. different. She what a just, shame. Yeah. So that's it. Well, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a tough one. That was. That was. He was a. Uh, awful awful monster and my heart goes out to all his victims and the fact that there is un- uh, unidentified mm-hmm. victims as well is absolutely awful that oh, yeah. families somewhere are missing loved mm-hmm. ones or yeah. you know just well, they can't get that sort of final closure i mean not you know you you, you want to know what's happened to your, yeah. your relative don't you but oh no that was that wasn't great i don't i mean that was good discussing but maybe not <laughs> I didn't like what he did. No. So, but anyway. Thanks for. You can follow or contact us um, on Instagram and uh, Twitter. It's crime. Oh, that sounded weird. Crime underscore divers underscore pod. Um, we also have a Facebook page if you just go on to Facebook and search for Crime Divers Podcast and request to join. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. That's it. See you next week. See you next week. Bye. Bye.